I'm Marty Hurst. I'm the Interim Dean of the School of Information, and I want to give you a warm welcome to our first Distinguished Dean's Distinguished Speaker Series of the semester. I need to make a notice uh, for those people who are online as well as those who are in the audience. This event is being live streamed and recorded and may be posted online on the web. If you have, if you ask any questions or make any comments, they may be included in the live stream and recording. So we've all been notified of that. All right, now I get to do the fun part. I uh, <laughs> get to introduce uh, Sandra Akisti. We're especially excited to have him here because we're very proud of him as a graduate of our PhD program. And he's made very good in the world. He's the trustees professor of information technology and public policy at the Heinz School at CMU. His research combines economics, behavioral uh, research, and data mining to investigate the role of privacy in a digital world. Very ice fully. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And he got his PhD here, a master's degree uh, from also from Berkeley, the London School of Economics and Trinity College Dublin. So he's a triple master's. Sounds like a tennis association. <laughs> uh, and he's re received many awards, he's very decorated, and uh, he's published in all the top places. I'm not going to go through all this. You can read this. I will say there was TED Talks on privacy mm -hmm. and human behavior have been viewed over 1.5 million times. So I think this goes well for his ability to give a good talk. This is the logistics. Uh, also, I'm just going to talk through 11. I know some people have to leave at 11, so don't be shy about that. Mm -hmm. And then we'll do uh, comments in the final 10 minutes. So take it away, Alessandro. Let's give a warm welcome. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, everyone. Absolutely delighted and honored to be here, to be back. Uh, this talk will be a story, um, a story that starts right here in uh, these halls and continues nowadays because the research I started here has defined then uh, my, my work for two decades. And it's a research which combines data, economics, technology, and policy. But I have to start with a warning, um, not to disappoint anyone, but I will, leave, I will not really give you a definitive answer to the question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that a, a single talk or, or, or a single career can, uh, can fully, fully uh, answer this question. But I do believe it is an important question. And it's a question that currently motivates most of my work. So what I will uh, try to do would be what I like to call the hourglass style of talk, where I start very broad. So I set up uh, big ideas and big questions. Um, I will spend probably about uh, maybe one third uh, of my time uh, with you on, on the big picture. Uh, and then I will uh, zoom in uh, and I will only tackle some very specific, uh, very narrow uh, version of these big questions. Um, that's where I will go into more traditional seminar mode, presenting uh, a couple of studies in some degree of that. And then finally, I will open up again uh, to, uh, to, the bigger, to the bigger issues. And I was mentioning that for me, this kind of research started right here. Um, I moved uh, in uh, 1999 as indeed as a, as a student of economics uh, to the high school uh, at the time of SIMS. Um, and I came here specifically because I wanted to do interdisciplinary research. I wanted to do economics of information. Um, and, uh, and I was lucky enough to have uh, how um, as my main, main advisor. At the time, uh, my goal was to do economics of AI. Um, I was very much interested in AI, which at the time was completely different world from what it is now. At the time, it was expert systems. There was some talk of intelligent agents, but really, there was not much machine learning as we have now. But then instead, I pivoted to privacy. And, and the reason why I pivoted to privacy were precisely because I was here. I, um, I took a class. Uh, with Pam, uh, she was, uh, um, I think you were uh, co-teaching it with Nancy at the time. Uh, and it was a class about uh, essentially teaching uh, digital law to non-law students, right? And it was this particular class that fascinated me related to privacy in the digital society. And I ended up doing a, because I came from economics, doing my essay, my final project on economics and privacy. Also how it just written, uh, what later became uh, a seminal piece on economics of privacy titled e e in, um, Economic Aspects of Personal Data and Privacy. 
He had published it in 1996, um, and he was still interested in the space. So we started working together on uh, essentially the economics of privacy. The, the, this idea of uh, uh, analyzing the trade-offs associated with protecting and sharing data. And the trade-offs are there for consumers, for data holders, for society as a whole. So for instance, they could arise from cookies, which were the big privacy scare in, back in, uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, looks very quaint. And, and if, we, if we look back at things now, 20 years later, uh, but there are trade-offs that arise when consumers are attacked online through cookies. Uh, both, both good things and, and, and bad things can emerge. And, um, but again, going back to this place, uh, I was doing economics. Um, I was learning from, from Powell, uh, Yale, um, but I was also exposed, thanks to the amazing people that I was lucky to have in my, in my committee, John, uh, uh, Florian Sittemeyer was, was in marketing, uh, the late Doug Tiger, uh, to, I was forced to open up my horizons to learn more about technology, cryptography, et cetera, so that um, these interdisciplinary background allowed me then to um, uh, branch out in research into different directions following my PhD uh, and to follow what have been the incredible developments in the field of privacy in the last 20 years. For instance, how people have reacted to the increasing collection of personal data and how consumers have made decisions about their personal um, information online. And whether these decisions are or not to some, to some degree paradoxical. Um, I started working on this difference between attitudes, what people say about privacy, being uh, privacy being important, or important to them, in what they seem to do sometimes, uh, seemingly being quite careless uh, with uh, data disclosures online, this later came to be known as the so-called privacy paradox. There is debate whether this apparent dichotomy is paradoxical or not, but really what was in, of interest to me was the ability to use behavior decision research and behavior economics to try to understand better how we as consumers and people react uh, to the changes, the, the technological changes that involve our personal information, which in turn led me then to get interested in uh, online social networks, online social media, and start collaborating again, this interdisciplinary power, right? Uh, with computer scientists and data miners. Uh, CMU, we started in uh, early 2004, creating accounts on the Carnegie email on Facebook network and downloading what other people were revealing uh, on Facebook at the time, the Carnegie then on Facebook network. So this is how uh, Facebook looked in 2004. Uh, and I'm blacking out the names and the uh, personal photo of uh, this uh, former senior student. Uh, this collaboration with uh, computer scientists allow us to do interesting things and discover uh, and contribute to this uh, growing body of research, which took place again in the last two decades on how much more can we infer about people from what they disclose? Can we de-anonymize uh, data we supposedly is anonymous? Can we infer something very sensitive, starting from information that apparently is not sensitive at all? Can we start, in fact, from a face in the crowd and by using facial recognition and uh, data photos that people have publicly disclosed about themselves online, can we find their names and their demographic information? Can we then combine this demographic information with other public data sets, such as those revealed by the government, the Social Security Administration publishes, used to publish, in fact, uh, the social security numbers of people who are dead in the so-called death master file, and can therefore ultimately predict social security numbers just starting from a phase, right? Um, and finally, this was a talk that I gave uh, about 10, 12 years ago here at the school. And to me, it, it really exemplifies how when it comes to privacy, we have to contend at the same time with economics, behavioral decision research, uh, technology and policy. We contend with the issues that nowadays, even though we have a regulation, for instance, in the United States, in most countries around the world, which does not allow employers during interviews to ask uh, personal questions to candidates, such as, uh, uh, do you plan to get married? Do you plan to have kids? Nowadays, we have technologies and we have a behavior which induces us to disclose openly information about ourselves, which employers could, in fact, find if they search our names online and if they find our Facebook profiles. 
And we then this information influence the decisions that employers make about ourselves. So, in essence, in the last uh, 15, 20 years, uh, um, this, uh, um, this has been really a wide ride in terms of uh, trying to use uh, economics, history research, computer science to, to look at how the world of privacy and data was, uh, was changing around us. And, and the field of privacy, especially, specifically the field of economics of privacy, grew a lot, so much so that a few years um, with Marcus Taylor and Ian Wagner, we were able to uh, publish a piece on the economics of privacy, essentially reviewing what progress had been made in the field of the economics as it pertains to privacy. Now, um, since 2016, when this piece came out, if anything, the, the, the area of the economics of privacy has grown even more. Uh, there have been uh, even more scholars um, contributing to, the, to, to this field, so much so that the NPR in 2022, uh, organized a workshop on the economics of privacy. Um, the organizers were Catherine Tucker and Avi Goldfarb, very well-known economists. And uh, in that workshop, they asked a number of people in the field to write chapters for a volume to make, uh, in a way, a census, an inventory, a, a point of the situation of research in the field. And uh, my piece, which uh, we come out shortly, it's titled Economics of Privacy and Crossroads, uh, tries to, uh, with, with love, but also with a critical lenses, look at the evolution of the economics of privacy and, and, and touches ultimately upon the question that gives title uh, to today's talk, who benefits from the data economy? Because in that particular chapter, I use this uh, metaphor of a, of a scale, of a balance, uh, perhaps an imperfect metaphor, but I hope a useful one. And with this metaphor, I try to capture how I believe the field of economics has influenced the public debate around Paris. Uh, in my view, the field of economics has uh, created this tension, has mostly focused on the tension between a world where there is more data and a world where there is uh, more privacy. Uh, as antithetical words. Either we have uh, uh, less regulation, uh, less uh, GDPRs, less CPPA, and therefore uh, more uncontrolled access to consumer data. And this world will lead to economic benefits, uh, efficiency, innovation, or we have a world with more regulation, perhaps more technology, uh, more controls over what firms can do with data. And that may guarantee some degree of autonomy, dignity, and freedom. Now, the problem is that economic research, especially empirical research, is mostly focused on the angle of uh, how our nesting data can create uh, economic benefits. Uh, and also on how, when we regulate privacy and we decrease to some extent the ability of corporations and companies to access data, how this creates a open opportunity cost by decreasing economic efficiency, decreasing uh, innovation, and so on and so forth. And this is problematic because I believe that my field has uh, not paid enough attention to the importance, to the value of privacy has in our society, and also to the cost that privacy violations have on individuals and society as well. Also, I believe we have not paid enough attention to the fact that privacy and data are not as antithetical goals as one may expect. In fact, that perhaps we have ways to extract value from consumer data while still guaranteeing and protecting individual privacy. And finally, the field, I believe, has not done enough to understand what in economic terminology I would refer to as the allocation of value of data. What do I mean by that? Uh, to the extent that value can be created from data. And I, 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 I would guess that all of us believe that that is the I, I, in a school of information, I don't believe I need to convince anyone that there is a great societal value we can harness from uh, tracking and usage of personal data. Where does that value go? How often we can have societal beneficial, societal beneficial uh, usage of tracking? With Josh, we were discussing a few minutes ago the usage of uh, mobile tracking data for, to, to target human, humanitarian aid. And how often instead, this nesting of data creates just reinforces oligopoly power and concentrates extraction of value into the hands of few data holders. I believe not enough work has been done 
in that area. And this is something that my research currently tries to investigate. So, and this, with this, we are transitioning now to the narrow part of the talk where I go deeper into some specific studies. What I would like to do for the next about 20, 40 minutes would be to present uh, the results of an economic experiment about, indeed, the allocation of value of data. Uh, as I told you, I will, I will tackle one specific narrow angle because I will be talking about behavior advertising, right? And then if time permits, I will also mention some results which pertains to this uh, uh, alleged dichotomy um, between uh, uh, data and privacy. I will focus specifically on uh, uh, differential privacy, uh, on the trade-offs uh, that arise from the deployment of differential privacy in US census data. Um, so starting with uh, this study, uh, study one, which is with uh, Eduardo Mostri and Idris Ajari, uh, is about behavior advertising and consumer wealth. And it is motivated by this, uh, um, um, sent this, uh, this quote uh, that uh, a, a advertising executive, uh, David Nelson, provided in around 2011 to the ad exchanger, which some of you may know as an online website for um, uh, essentially online advertising executives. And in answering your question, uh, <coughs> who benefits from behavior advertising? David Nelson replied, behavior advertising is an economic win-win. Um, benefits all different parties of the uh, online advertising ecosystem. By the way, the behavioral targeting uh, David Nelson was referring to is what I guess I don't need really to explain is what happens online every time you go online and one ad may be targeted to you based on your fixed behavior, essentially based on predictions and inferences made about your preferences starting from your online data. Um, now, I'm choosing to focus for this study on behavioral advertising, not because uh, that's the only channel through, uh, through which information about us is collected and used, uh, not necessarily even the most important, but it is historically very significant and uh, from a financial perspective, very, very significant. It's uh, in a way almost a Trojan horse through which uh, uh, consumer data collection is justified and explained to consumers precisely through frames such as this. Everyone benefits from this, right? Uh, consumers benefit because they see ads which are more relevant to them. Advertisers benefit because they can allocate scarce uh, advertising budget only to uh, the consumers more likely to be interested in the good. And uh, publishers, the New York Times online, the, the Washington Post online, etc., benefit because they can also sell more valuable advertising space and increase their revenues. Well, in economic terms, in theoretical economic terms, you can actually justify each of these claims. Uh, you can make a model where you have uh, uh, you depict online uh, behavior advertising as a two-sided platform uh, 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 economy with consumer publisher on one side and merchants on the other side, and you have the data economy intermediaries in the middle. Uh, and each side has search costs, right? Because consumers want to find products and merchants want to find consumers. They face into their search costs and find the right match. And the data economy intermediaries, you know, company like Google, Facebook, Meta, Alphabet, et cetera, precisely by virtue of having so much information about both sides of the market, they can reduce search costs for both sides. And in so doing, they create wealth. And those are the little arrows that go out from the intermediary box into the other place. So the reduction in search cost uh, improves indeed everyone's economic uh, returns. But there is another alternative or competing or perhaps not mutually exclusive frame for this market, which uses exactly the same players and acknowledges the same two-sided platform uh, framework, but rather than focusing on the search cost story, focuses on something else, focuses on the fact that consumers have finite attention and final touch. They cannot pay attention to all the ads presented to them. They also cannot pay, cannot buy all the products presented to them. Publishers, therefore, compete very, very aggressively with each other for that limited consumer attention. 
the New York Times dot uh, com, NYT dot com is at the same time competing for the eyeball of a visitor, uh, competing with uh, uh, a creator or creator on TikTok, an influencer on Instagram, uh, uh, someone's blog, and so on and so forth. Competition is very aggressive. Merchants are very aggressively competing with each other for the limited attention and budget. Because sure, you can keep increasing the number of ads that you push onto the consumer, but there is a finer number of ads that the consumer will pay attention to. And the merchant who is trying to uh, reach a consumer interest in a certain topic, for instance, a consumer is interested in playing golf. The merchant may try to reach the consumer with interest in playing golf. And back in the days, that merchant may have tried to buy an ad on a golf-related magazine in order to target a golf interested consumer. Nowadays, the merchant can target a golf interested consumer when they are on any web page uh, on any possible location online, uh, which doesn't need to be contextually related to golf. But in that very moment, many other merchants may try to bid for the same consumer in real time bidding, and these other merchants may be bidding on the, for the same consumer for completely different interests. Not golf, but perhaps the same consumer is interested in uh, uh, going in a vacation to Cancun, uh, or in uh, running shoes, or in Italian motorcycles. So there is this very aggressive competition to get the consumer to get the consumer attention. But in the middle, instead, that's where we have the oligopolies. Uh, clearly, I don't dismiss and discount the fact that the uh, online advertising ecosystem is vast and complex. There is a galaxy of players. Uh, that interact in complex ways. But ultimately, that market is dominated by very, very few firms. So under this alternative framing, economic theory, economically, uh, economic theory framing, where we have vast competition at two sides of the market and we have oligopoly in the middle, where would we expect more, most of the economic surplus to go to the middle, right? So I'm not saying that this frame is correct and uh, the prior is wrong. In fact, it is possible that both frames capture some element of reality, right? The problem is that we don't have very good and critical validation of ultimately how these different players, the consumers, the publishers, the merchants, and the intermediaries score. Because if we go back to, the, to this quote, it's remarkable how little we know about some of these players. For instance, most of the research, empirical research, is focused on advertisers. It's focused on the concept of advertising, advertising effectiveness, essentially click-through rates. Right? And we do know that behavior advertising increases click-through rates, but that's not the totality of the story because it is possible that merchants engage in essentially a zero-sum game where they all try to do behavior advertising, so they have uh, nominally high click-through rates, but they don't increase the market share because everyone else is doing the same. Publishers, they face a similar problem. Much less research on publishers, but there is some, including by myself, including by, from Google, etc. cetera. Uh, it does suggest that behaviorally targeted ads bring more money to publishers than untargeted ads. Although there is debate between how much, my results show a small increase, Google's results show a larger increase. But both my results and Google's results are mute regarding the more important issue, which is yes, nominally on a per impression rate, publishers may get more money when the ads they sell are targeted. But if you look at cross impressions, Publishers are now struggling, at least legacy publishers, because now the final consumer attention and budget to buy is spread through so many other players in the ecosystem, right? So we have to alternate the micro view, which could suggest publishers are doing well, to the macro aggregate view, which suggests uh, there is a problem for publishers. And finally, what about consumers? Content that you may be interested in, that refers to us, the people. How much research is about, uh, done empirically about the benefits to, to consumers? Well, I hope I don't sound uh, um, too bold or aggressive, but I would say very little, close to none. Uh, and it, this seems like a very bold statement. So allow me to explain it and justify it. I do stand by this point. Uh, the value that consumers receive from this behavioral advertising economy I believe is more often positive than actually demonstrated. Why? 
if you think about it, there are two possible values that we as consumers get from this, indirect and direct. Let me start from the indirect, which will not be the focus of my talk, and then I'll get to the direct. The indirect, what it is the indirect value, is essentially the argument that well, precisely because online uh, uh, targeted advertising brings more money to publishers, then publishers are able to produce more and better quality content and share it with people. So essentially consumers benefit indirectly by having free access to more and better quality content. It is a plausible claim. It is an incredibly difficult, difficult claim to demonstrate the causal, really, really difficult. So what I and many others in the field have tried to do is to work indirectly, try to tease out causality by looking at what happens when there, is, uh, when there are exogenous shocks like regulation, which may curtail to some degree targeting and see what downstream it, it effects it has on the ability of content providers to provide content, right? So we, we try to go at this interact. And what do we find? Unfortunately, as it often happens in research, we find very nuanced and mixed results. You can find results such as Jensen and Jensen et al, which suggests that GDPR severely, severely diminish the provision of free apps uh, on, uh, in the European app ecosystem. So there we suggest you reduce tracking due to regulation, you reduce uh, free apps. Or you have studies such as the fair and share uh, for full disclosure, my name is hidden in the et al. So uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> there, there is an element of bias here in which we found that no, GDPR did not really influence, uh, impact negatively European, US, and media websites' ability to provide content compared to US uh, uh, news and media website. And with uh, Crystal Sure, we find that Apple um, ADT, you know, uh, Apple transition a um, couple of years ago uh, to the, this application transparency uh, framework, which by the changes the default settings of, uh, um, of tracking for uh, iOS users, did not uh, uh, negatively impact uh, the ability of uh, uh, app developers in the uh, Apple ecosystem to provide new apps. So. Mix yourself at the very least. And what about the direct? This is what I'm going to discuss today. So what is the direct play? It's very common, right? Uh, well, consumers benefit from these ads because they get more relevant products and services. And indeed, if you look at some research, and again, I stand by my claim that there is very little research on consumer utility, but I was telling you there is research which shows advertising effectiveness and shows increased, increased click-through rate for target ads. An increased click-through rates for targeted ads suggest, in economic terminology, that these ads are reducing search costs. Uh, they're reducing physically, in the sense that consumers can click on an ad and then end up with a product, and they reduce search costs also more metaphorically, in the, in the sense they present goods which evidently are more likely to be close to the consumer preferences than a random ad. Okay, so far, so good. But, in this the case, you don't need to be an economist to realize that search costs are only one part of a consumer utility function, right? <laughs> uh, if a consumer ends up buying a product, ultimately, how much they benefit or not from the product is function not just of the search costs of carrying the product, but more of all many other variables. How much do they end up paying for the product? What is the quality of the product itself? What is the quality of the vendor which is selling the product? <laughs> And what we entirely lack is the ability to discern how these other variables, uh, price, quality of vendors, quality of product, differentially affect consumer welfare and consumer utility in the context of behavior targeted ads versus uh, a counterfactual approach, for instance, consumer searching for products. We don't have the kind of research, and that's what exactly what we try to do. So we ran two experiments. Uh, study one, and then a replication study, study two, both were pre-registered, and they were online experiments uh, with uh, participants uh, recruited from prolific academy, in which, in a nutshell, we try to compare both objective and subjective metrics of consumer satisfaction, consumer welfare, across three conditions. The objective metrics are things such as price, vendor quality, and so on. And I will explain better why I say objective, but quote unquote, there is a limit to how objective you can be about those, those metrics. The subjective are basically self-report. 
how consumer, how satisfied consumers were with one product versus that. And we compare these across products that have been behaviorally targeted to our participants on their machines, on their browsers, versus competing competitor products that have been found through searchers versus entirely random products. So the experiment, each of the two studies, work in three stages. In the first stage, we uh, recruit them, participants who like, and we have them visit uh, our experimental platform and uh, learn our instructions, watch a video, do a tutorial to make sure that they understood what they had to do, and then we randomly assign them to visit a, a number of websites uh, that we had uh, priorly selected, previously selected, because our analysis showed that they, that they were websites highly likely to show on their front page behaviorally targeted ads, for instance, front page of CNN. So a participant was asked to visit a randomly picked URL, for instance, CNN.com, with their computer and their browser. By the way, we only focus on Chrome users, and our choice of Chrome was due to two factors. Chrome is by, by large the most popular uh, browser today, is also by default one of the most trackable. So for instance, here a participant will be instructed to look for an ad on this page and may find, for instance, uh, the particular ad, right? Uh, and uh, by the way, we, as I mentioned, we had done prior studies uh, using the information that is, uh, you know, uh, often on the, in one of the corners of the ad, suggesting us that, yes, those ads are being behavior targeted. So the participant was instructed to copy the link address of this ad and then submit it to us through our experimental platform, essentially submitting some pledges. Uh, and you can see that the, the, the very first part of the URL is double click, which is one of the largest players in the online advertising. So participants will see many, many of these uh, of these links and will submit uh, uh, the uh, many of the uh, pages and will submit many of these links. And that trigger the second phase, which we call the intermediate stage, in which our computers and our scripts would visit those URLs and would, uh, for instance, here end up in the landing page. So you can see this the same uh, link as before. And uh, it starts without click, but it ends up on a page which is benadrill.com, right? So we would visit the landing page and there we would capture product information, uh, the, such as the price, uh, the name of the product, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Parenthesis. The, this brings up an enormously important experimental design issue and question that we had before running the study. Can we know that when our computers and our automated scripts visit uh, those, UR, those URLs end up seeing the exact same information that the participant would have seen? Because if we couldn't demonstrate it to ourselves, then our entire experimental design would make no sense whatsoever. And the answer yeah, is yes, uh, exactly the same information. How do we know? Because we tested this repeatedly by having different computers with different IP addresses, grabbing one ad, and then passing the ad to another computer, and then the other computer with a different IP address and different uh, cookie information would visit that URL. And then we would compare the data, essentially the page, the HTML of the across computers. We would always find 100% the same information. Uh, essentially, this suggests that whatever targeting is happening happens to the level of uh, that long string of characters, it no longer happens right here. So satisfied with the fact that we have uh, uh, um, uh, internal consistency, we capture this data and then our scripts also search for the same product on Google search. And we collected information uh, from the uh, organic search results for what we may call competitor products. Uh, the perfect definition of competitor products would, uh, would require me probably to go off, off a tangent of 10 minutes. If you allow me, I will leave it at that. And then perhaps in the q and I can go more in depth into what competitor means because easy to say a little harder than to define precisely. 
stage two, the final stage, uh, was uh, took place about two weeks, uh, one to two weeks after stage one. And the participants who had been part of stage one were called back and were presented in random orders the products that we had captured information for. Remember, they not necessarily had clicked on any of those products. Uh, and the products we presented to each participant were nine, uh, randomly ordered, three products which had been behaviorally targeted to the participant in stage one, three products that we had found through our scripted searches, so from organic search results, and three random products. What do we mean by random? Essentially, these were products that had been targeted to other participants in the study, which from the perspective of our target participants are essentially random because we can expect the probability of participant A and any other participant in our sample having exactly the same preferences, cookie and cookie information, the probability is minuscule. Because this is a, a lecture where I try to cover the big picture and, uh, and many different, uh, different topics, I will, I will only focus on the results from these two conditions rather than going uh, too much in depth. Also, I told you, we collected both objective and subjective self-reported metrics, but again, for this type of poll, I will only focus on the objective. Only in one case, I will mention one result for the subjective metrics because they were particular interest. And of course, in the Q&A, absolutely <laughs> likely to go deeper into any of this. Okay, study one, that was done in uh, spring and summer 2001, uh, sorry, 2021, uh, close to 500 participants from prolific, uh, they were all from the United States. Uh, uh, they skewed uh, they skewed towards higher education, so we make no claim whatsoever of these results being nationally representative. Uh, and also, we capture whether they were they had been using the past uh, uh, technologies such as ad blockers, which of course they had to uh, um, deactivate for the study, but also other technologies such as anti-tracking or VPN because this would influence the results and therefore we wanted to control econometrically for their use in this case. First results, vendor quality. We have two measures of vendor quality. Uh, one is uh, web ratings from, uh, from a uh, uh, online website which rates other websites, but the more credible one I feel is Better Business Bureau. Uh, I assume, assume that everyone here knows about better business bureau ratings. So you know that they go from A plus to F and then not found. We compare the percentage of vendors in uh, the ads, basically those who were targeting ads versus the vendors who pop up in search results. We compare the distribution of these vendors across these different uh, quality ratings. And what we find and what's remarkable to us is that whereas uh, from search you have a much, high, very high probability that vendors in search are very high quality, not so for the vendors in ads. In fact, we have this uh, essentially one out of five probability of ending up with F-rated vendors. The F-rated vendors are particularly bad vendors. To get an F-rating of better business below, you must be the vendor that essentially uh, maybe it doesn't ship the product or it sh ships the product and is uh, malfunctioning or incomplete. And then the consumer complains and the vendor doesn't uh, um, satisfy the consumer. Yes. It seems like it's an apples to oranges comparison because the search ads are regulated by one entity by and large, right? Google decides what ads get shown on Google search pages. I'm going, I'm on going to cite ads. There are you know, innumerable parties who can place an ad on a website. And I'm going to go back exactly to that, yes. Okay. Um, prices, uh, I, we compare prices in two ways. First, we compare prices across, across all products in ad and in search. Uh, and uh, when I say all products, uh, you have to consider the fact that some products were actually, and we go here a little into the discussion of competitor products, where Apple, to, 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 to research on your terminology, there was a little bit of an Apple and, uh, Apple and Origins problem here. Because uh, maybe uh, some products that were behaviorally targeted to consumers were unique in the sense that only one vendor vends that particular product. So we had to compare this to a competitor, which was sold uh, by another vendor and, the, and was slightly different. <coughs> which is why here, I first present these comparisons, but we take the log because we have lots of uh, price dispersion. And we do find that on average, this difference is very significant because we have, uh, it's a, um, these are logs. 
the prices tend to be higher with, uh, for the product in ads com compared to the competitor in search. But then we repeat the work, this time only focusing on products which were sold identical in identical format by multiple vendors. Imagine uh, being able to buy Benadryl from Amazon, from Benadryl.com, from Target, from CVS.com. And here we find again that more than one half of the times, the cheapest price is in the uh, organic search results rather than in the behavior targeted ads. Uh, in terms of uh, subjective metrics, uh, the one that I wanted to pay uh, you to pay attention to um, is the fact that uh, relative to the baseline category, which is uh, behaviorally targeted products, search and random go exactly in the direction we would hope. The search products are, are, as you see, not statistically significantly different in terms of relevance, subjectively reported relevance for, for our participants, compared to the behavior targeted ads. Essentially, what we are saying is that there is no difference in relevance between search products and ads products. This is exactly what we are hoping, and that makes sense. It's simply saying that when we look for competitors, the competitor product is as relevant as the behavior targeted one, which is exactly what it, it's a sanity check. Whereas the random product is much less relevant. There is a negative sign, strong sneaker. Also makes sense, right? When you present a random product that had been targeted to another participant, the participant looks at it and says, this is not relevant to me. Makes sense. So this is a good sanity check. It tells us that the experiment by and large is working. Why am I pointing your attention to this? Because you will see something quite interesting that we discover and we go and we and we dig as we dig deeper into that particular result. So study one results were to some degree surprised because they were telling us that the products displaying behavior targeted us tended to be associated with higher price and lower quality vendors, which begs the question that search has anticipated why there could be these different essentially translating in my own terminology, what search is asking, there could be different dyna dynamics leading to a product popping up in search results and a product popping up in ads. But what are those dynamics? So interestingly, one of uh, Hal's most famous studies is 1980 famous AER piece on a model of sales, which was written basically 15 years before the World Wide Web gives us an indication of what may potentially be happening here. I have to stress that this is a post hoc conjecture. Uh, we didn't start with that hypothesis in mind, but looking at the data, we felt, oh, maybe Al was seeing something already in the 1980s. Hal presented this model of competition where merchants self-select into the merchants who go for the informed consumers, the one who are price conscious and quality conscious, and the merchants who instead go for the uninformed consumers, the one that don't spend time searching for the best price and buy from the first merchant they find. Of course, Hal in the 1980 was talking about physical merchants, but this is direct application to what happens online because online we can assume that there are some consumers who are uh, willing to spend the time com doing comparative, sh uh, comparative shopping and looking for the best price and the good quality. And some consumers that see the ad and they think this uh, is a product I like and they click on that. So what if merchants, some merchants self-select into going for their type consumers? And what if among those, those merchants, there are merchants who are in fact uh, unethical and they basically target only for consumers with higher prices and lower quality. So we look at the distribution of merchants in uh, uh, search results and in ads. And what we found, is that there is a huge, huge difference in the distribution of vendors in, uh, in certain ads. Here, I don't know if you can read, we have the list of uh, merchants appearing, most frequently appearing in search results. Uh, you can imagine, even if you can't read, you can imagine what the big, uh, the big uh, <laughs> entity on the left is. It, it, it is Amazon, of course, completely dominates search results, organic search results. But interestingly, all the other vendors are also all big, big vendors. There is no one small vendor there. Why? Precisely because uh, Google's search algorithm is pretty good and uses you know, this quality score and filters out smaller websites and uh, makes it possible for large, high-quality vendors to appear in search results. Uh, 
But then uh, if you are a small vendor, then what can you do if you want to reach consumers? Well, if you are a small vendor, you have no other way than uh, buying apps because uh, your probability of appearing in the first page of search results is really, really low. So when we look at the vendors in ads, we find indeed that together with the usual suspect, once again, we have Amazon being the largest one, we also have companies which are unknown. Uh, my my netlegs.com, for instance. And the point is that among these vendors, there is this uh, kind of self-selection between the ones which are small but good and the ones that are small but unethical. So this may indeed explain the results, but we were still, uh, um, um, we wanted to make sure that our results were robust. And that's why we ran a second study, a replication study. And I will go quick here because essentially, I never seen something like this. The results were replicated pretty much one to one. The distribution of vendors in study one, distribution of vendors in study two. Better Business Bureau rating study one, Better Business Bureau rating study two. Study two, by the way, was run pretty much exactly one year after study one. So this suggests that these patterns are to some degree, some degree quite uh, robust. Uh, vendor uh, price uh, in log difference study one, vendor price log difference uh, study two. Same story. Uh, vendor identical products distribution study one. Vendor distribution uh, identical uh, product price uh, study two. It's it, it's remarkable the degree of uh, of consistency one year after that we found. Uh, we also did some latent utility analysis, which I will skip because it will, it will require another five minutes to discuss. Um, I promise you that I told you about the subjective self-reported uh, um, metrics such as relevance because that was the source of a big surprise to us, right? And now I, fulfill, I fulfilled that promise. We had found in study one that there was no difference in self-reported uh, uh, metrics of relevance across targeted ads and search, and that makes, that makes sense. But there was a difference between targeted ads and random. That also may differ, may, may sense because the random ads, the random products should be less relevant. And that's what we found. Well, in study two, which was a replication study, we added at the end of the study, a few more questions, which were motivated by the open and the comments that participants in study one had given us. Some participants had told us, well, yeah, I saw this ad and because I've been searching for it for the product before. So we thought about asking at the end of study two questions about, have you been searching for this type of product before? And uh, we catch, we use the answer to control for our results. And when we do that, the higher relevance of the targeted ads relative to random goes away. This suggests that the higher relevance of the targeted ads comes, I would say, in the caveats, the limitation of business study done with prolific participants, uh, small samples compared to what companies like Google and Meta can do. But in the context of our study, predominantly the higher relevance of targeted ads came from retargeting, from people searching, already knowing what they wanted, and being provided an ad for something that they already wanted, which decreases the informational value of the ad. So in a nutshell, uh, I would say that the results, uh, when we go back to the bigger question I was asking, the value, the behavior targeted ads have for consumers, I would say that it is at least safe to call them nuance. Now, this leads me having discussed with only a very narrow question about the broader picture to be willing to discuss for a few minutes the other study. But Marty, I hear the campanile. Should I stop here or go a few minutes longer? Go ahead. And if anyone, I know some people have to teach now or go to classes. So if you do, go ahead. Uh, but why don't you continue? You. Your the second study, thank you, will be uh, rather brief because it's a study about uh, the essential differential privacy and US census. And it was published in Science uh, just, just one year ago. And uh, it's about uh, the, uh, the following problem. Differential privacy is one of the many tools that in the last 15, 20 years, um, the number of scholars have been uh, proposing computer science and statistics, federated learning, homomorphic encryption uh, uh, are others, K anonymity are others, to allow, in a way, to have the cake and eat it too when it comes to privacy. Essentially, 
protecting data while still, while still allowing beneficial usage of data. And uh, the census, uh, under the, uh, the vision of John Abbott, has been at the forefront of pushing for the deployment uh, of differential privacy in the context of uh, um, uh, disclosure, protected disclosure of census data. So CESO has been really active in that uh, space. But of course, we do know that there is a privacy data utility curve. And, and in fact, a number of uh, entities, including scholars, have been very, very uh, critical of the US census move to deploy differential privacy. Um, differential privacy has been uh, subject of uh, a number of uh, attacks by scholars, by politicians, by journalists. And uh, we started thinking uh, whether uh, these attacks, while legitimate, part of legitimate discourse, may to some extent be underlooking or overlooking um, an important angle on the debate related to uh, privacy in general and data utility. And what is this angle? Most of the current debate on differential privacy focuses on the noise that differential privacy causes. Essentially, you take a data set and you have a certain uh, estimate uh, based on uh, the original raw data set. You add differential privacy and you are messing up things. Now, you no longer know, uh, you, you have this uh, noisy version of that original estimate, which may lead to paradoxical results, such as the census data now tells you that there are uh, 1,000 people living underwater in Chicago. Why? Because, you know, due to the differentially uh, the noise injected to differential privacy, now it looks like a certain zip code may have more people than it could, it could really have. But the point is that differential privacy, differential privacy only adds noise to data sets which already have inbuilt noise and error. It's not like the ground proof, it's not like census data is literally the ground proof. It, it, it is itself some estimation of the ground truth, and the US Census, of course, knows it. In fact, the US Census even provides distribution of the noise uh, and error that is likely to happen with their measurements. So essentially, there is existing data error. Some of it is quantifiable, and the US Census has distribution for it, and some of it is entirely quantifiable. If we focus on the quantifiable, can we then uh, look at the, uh, one particular way in which US census data is used, which is Title I education funding? Essentially, uh, the Department of Education uses census estimates to make super important decisions how much money to allocate to different uh, districts, uh, um, school districts across the United States. That's a very important decision. Can we look at the real data from census and from the Department of Education? So, how much money was allocated to different districts based on US census data? Can then simulate the impact of the data error, the fact that the US Census itself knows that there is error in their data, can we quantify how much difference this error could cause in terms of allocation of funding? For instance, how much money this error, this inherent data error could cause uh, a district to lose uh, in terms of funding? Can we then compare these to the error in funding due to differential privacy using two different epsilon? And I can explain the Q&A for those of you who are interested and not familiar what Epsilon means in the, in the concept of differential, differential privacy. Suffice to say that the smaller Epsilon means more privacy. And the Epsilons we are using are very, are lots of privacy. In, in, in most common applications, the Epsilon are even larger. So here we are talking almost about worst case scenarios in terms of being very privacy, privacy protected. Can we compare this too? Can we compare the Nissan question? And this, in a nutshell, is what we found. The bar, the bar chart here, from this point, all the way to the point, which is about um, $11 billion, um, in fact, close to $12 billion, captured the entire, the entire amount of a Title I uh, um, uh, funding that the Department of Education in 2021 had given to school districts across the United States based on census data. Our estimate tells us that school districts lose up to $1 billion due to these data errors. So the, not differential price. The data errors can cause, in aggregate, uh, across uh, 1,000, uh, average across 1,000 simulations of this process, 
1 billion dollar in losses essentially getting more money than they would need relative to a hypothetical ground roof hypothetical because no one knows what the ground roof is not even assessed and this is instead the error that differential privacy is bringing to the table uh, with uh, super strict privacy because an epsilon zero one is really highly protected 50 additional uh, million uh, uh, lost uh, in terms of misallocation, mis essentially uh, school district uh, uh, losing money because of differential privacy. Under still pretty good privacy, but not as strict, so epsilon one is even less than one million. And we feel that this is useful because it puts things, at least this, that was our goal, it puts things in perspective, right? That when people attack differential privacy, it's a legitimate debate to, to have had, but perhaps if we look at the bigger picture, we realize that differential privacy may not be the enemy. And by the way, there is, we also find the unfortunate results that others have already found in the literature, that these errors are not similarly distributed across the United States. They, they target certain populations rather than others. There are very good, simple explanations for the uh, um, statistical uh, grammar explanation. But in general, this the national point, in the national, yes, Differential privacy may be causing misallocation, but there are misallocation which happen in the margin of much larger misallocation. By the way, we can also, and we propose in our paper, we can pro we have policy suggestions which can reduce those uh, uh, those uh, uh, those misallocations. So um, there is perhaps a way to use these technologies to minimize privacy costs, uh, uh, but also minimize. Which brings me then to the to, to the final part, right? Um, which is where I am, which is uh, what I presented today, and thank you for allowing me to go a little long. Were admittedly very very narrow sub questions on a on a on a much much broader topic, which is where I started at the beginning. Uh, but I do hope that this combination of economics and technology and uh, and in combining research on privacy preserving analytics, the economic implications in consumer decision making can ultimately help us not just understand better how to use these tools, but perhaps also to promote the deployment of these tools. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the fabulous, really, really interesting talk, Alessandro. Uh, while people are thinking about their questions, I'll, ans I'll ask one of the ones from online. Uh, from Ella, your results are amazing. I wanna ask, when you talk about search, I'm assuming you're talking about a Google search, but isn't Google search results also a form of targeted ads? The algorithm provides the results in a way that puts one sponsored vendors above others and two more relevant or targeted vendors at the top. So isn't search a non-neutral uh, way to get to products? It's a great question. Great question, and yes, I would uh, uh, I would partly agree. Uh, I, I I would say that there is no clean, super clean way. I think of tapping the question it goes back also to search point. Inherently, we are we, we are dealing with apple and oranges. What I can add is that although I didn't have the time to discuss it here because again I was presenting kind of the cliff note version of the, of, of the paper, uh, we uh, the results I presented focus on organic search results but we also were able to collect the sponsored search results and we find the same patterns, which was a great surprise to us. By same patterns, I mean that we find these uh, differential in price and in quality, both were comparing targeted, behaviorally targeted ads to organic search results, and we're comparing uh, behaviorally targeted ads to sponsor search results. So, so there must be something specific in the behavior targeted ads or specific in the search algorithms which contributes to these differences. Uh, can we go to search? To follow up, you, you didn't quite answer my question, which was, and it's not really a question, it's more of a comment. Mm -hmm. I'm, <laughs> with regard to the search results, there's- so I didn't answer. <laughs> There's also really one authority, right? So if, if, if Someone like a scam company you know, that's, that's selling defective products or just outright fraud, mm -hmm. you know, either buys Google, you know, search ads, um, or they show up in the top 10 results frequently. Someone can contact Google, complain, and the, the ads will no longer appear or the site will get delisted from Google search. Whereas on an, a website, 
there are so many entities that can inject ads into that website. So as part of like the open RTV protocol, mm -hmm. right? You have many different entities participating in this. And so if one of them is a fraudulent company that's, you know, that wants to push, you know, ads for, you know, to perpetuate their fraud, it's just a matter of them, you know, going to whichever ad network will accommodate them. And as they get, you know, kicked out of ad networks, they just move on to the next ad network. And it's not really going to prevent their ability to show ads, you know, for their frauds on, on websites. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's an apples to orange compar comparison and why it's not that unexpected that you would ex you'd find more disreputable companies in the website ads. Um, so again, to me, this is about the, the causes for, 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 for the results, but that doesn't change the fact that the results are what they are. Oh, yeah. And, and in terms of consumer welfare, this is important, right? You agree, yeah. agree. Yeah. And, and by the way, following what you're saying and connecting this to the question by uh, Ella, Ella um, there is a potential explanation for why we find the same patterns also when we look when we look at sponsor search results. Sponsor search results are those that um, um, appear when you're searching, for instance, for a product and the merchant has bought that keyword, right? That's and it is again consistent with how story that I was making, or, or, or rather our usage of how 1985. Because if you believe the story of the informed and informed consumers, the consumers who are searching for a product are more likely, probably, to be the kind of consumer who is either informed or wants to be informed. So they, by searching, they are already signaling some propensity to I want to find different uh, outlets and perhaps compare them for this product which means that it, it is conceivable that the merchants that buy sponsor search account for the fact that people who are using keywords are more likely to be informed or to, to want to be informed compared to the consumers who just see an ad on, uh, on a website and click on the, on the ad. So it is potentially part of the story. Uh, John, yeah, did you have a call? Josh and then John, yeah. So, first, really nice talk. I really like the participants, I think it's great now. Thank you. Um, so first, to, just to confirm my understanding of the question, uh, I mean, you started, so the first paper you presented um, was motivated by this question of whether behavioral targeting is, in, how it's impacting consumer welfare. Yes. Right? Yes. Just to be clear, the study doesn't actually say anything about impacts, right? It's, it's talking about what association is between the current set of behavioral targeting and, you know, how that consumer welfare might work, which is fine. It's yeah. very interesting. And especially because you have like an interpretation study that suggests there might be some type of stability in that relationship. Yeah. The question is like, can you think of a research design? And I'm sure you've thought about this that would actually allow you to empirically adjudicate that causal question. It's it's uh, it's a great question. Uh, I we have been thinking about it. We have not yet found a uh, a clean design. If you have something in mind, I would love to keep the conversation, uh, the conversation on. Uh, it, it's tricky, also because uh, uh, capturing and putting all these different variables together into a definition of consumer welfare is very tricky, right? So we, the closest we got at that was by using this latent uh, utility analysis, which I only very briefly <laughs> refer to uh, in one of my slides. It doesn't get at your point. But I mention it because it's a step in the direction of trying to put together. Okay, so we have search costs that perhaps go down, Our prices perhaps go up, quality perhaps go up. What else is maybe happening? Can we put all these together into one single function? That's very tricky, right? Um, so um, we, I do hope. I don't want this to be my last study on the particular topic. I do hope to, that we can come up with more. Uh, research on different designs. Right now, I wouldn't know precisely how to solve the bucket. It's a good question. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering uh, if you can say more about what role can be played by the platforms that are currently facilitating and enabling these behavioral targeting events. So in your example, you, you, you highlight that double click, right? I'm curious what is the distribution of different platforms? You know, are they, I imagine that they are dominant. Um, 
then to what extent they are also now, they can also pay gatekeeping. Just like in the case of Google, right? Sorry, to what, to what extent they can? They, to what extent how, how they can the platform yeah. can also do some quality control or gatekeeping, right? If 20% of them are advertising through their platform, right? And for F rating, right? Um, is there anything that they can do? That's a, that's, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, I don't have the, a, a, a good answer. I can uh, discuss and speculate with you uh, a, a, along, these, uh, uh, along these dimensions. Uh, I do believe that there is a strong element of gatekeeping. Uh, and uh, uh, it goes back to the slide where I try to present the two frames, the two theoretical economic uh, frames uh, that we want to use to, to, to discuss these markets. Uh, under the frame two, the focus is on the oligopoly power in the middle, uh, which is, uh, is an example of gatekeeping. Yeah. Control over data means economic power. Economic power means more control over data. These uh, forces are self-reinforcing in, in, in my view. Uh, in, in this regard, and I know that this was not precisely into your question, but I would, I would like to uh, uh, go there. Uh, there have been, as you know, recent discussions for more privacy preserving behavior advertising. Uh, and Google, for instance, has been in the forefront of uh, removing third party, going away from third party cookies and replacing with federated learning or perhaps topics. And I feel that it's. Uh, um, um, it's uh, what's interesting here is that on one hand, uh, this could be seen positively in terms of the, the, there will be less uh, cross device uh, tracking and a visitor's data to a website will be less likely to be leaked around. On the other, on the other hand, could actually reinforce precisely these uh, gate keeping dynamics where. Uh, one browser, one entity has even more control over the uh, online uh, in inference, online behavior of inferences consumers, and therefore even more control on the uh, market for behavior advertising. Um, I want to make this point because uh, I don't want to sound as a uh, entirely naive about the ability of uh, uh, privacy and anti technology to solve all problems on earth, uh, because you could deploy different uh, privacy or you could deploy federated learning uh, into a system and yet the ultimate outcomes maybe nominally you may have some degree of anonymity but ultimately you may not actually solve either the economic imbalances or even the privacy of end users. I think Jen was next. Alessandro can you go back to that framing slide? Because my question builds on that. Sure. Uh, let's see if I have a fast way. Yeah, it's fast enough. No, no. Thank you. This one, here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's kind of funny to ask this question given that your advisor was on the stand in the DOJ trial against Google <laughs> last week. Um, but so I'm very focused on uh, framing two and the data economy intermediaries piece. Yes. Um, I mean, I have my own opinion about how to you know, chip into that that space. Yes. Um, but just to build on this question of you know when you ask the companies about the value of consumer data, they come back with a lot of like it's not worth anything. You know, your data individually, nothing. Mm -hmm. you, you get nothing out of it. Um, but at the same time, they're some of the wealthiest companies on the planet. Um, so I'm just curious where you sit right now about how to insert the consumer potentially, if you think that's the solution into the intermediary process. You know, so for example, one of the outcomes of the DOJ trial might be tell Google they have to break the search off into a different company. I don't think that necessarily is the solution in terms mm -hmm. of kind of addressing this the underlying data issues. Um, but I'm just curious, kind of what, what's your take or what have you seen the discussions focus on in kind of the economic space around this issue? Thank you. This is another, Jen, this is another great question. Super Maybe difficult too question. big, but you know. Yes, it's a great question. So it's super difficult and you know it, right? Because it, it's both because it's, it's challenging to 
it's easier to point out the problem that come up with a good solution. And, and it's also difficult to define what good is. And to the, the extent to which you can define good uh, positive, positively, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about positive versus normative economics, or you need to resort to normative arguments, such as, no, we take a stand and we say privacy is important just because regardless of what numerical quantification or privacy trade-offs uh, uh, you can come up with. Okay, so put, after putting the caveat forward, I would say that there, there, there are two angles here, two points that I feel I can make. One that I feel quite strongly about, and the other where I myself keep second guessing myself. The, what I feel strongly about, and I wonder, and we can discuss it later, how yourself you feel about these topics, I think I know what the solution is not, mm -hmm. which is not more notice and consent. Yeah, right. It's not more <laughs> privacy policies. It's not more privacy settings. Uh, and, and here, I, 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 I do, I'm trying to express not, not just my opinion, but essentially what I think I've learned from my own research on behavioral economics of privacy, that just uh, trying to resolve privacy problems with notice and consent regimes, essentially, is a form of consumer responsabilization. It's pushing the cost of problems the consumers didn't create, pushing them back onto the user, saying, oh, okay, read these 15 pages uh, every time you go to a new website, learn all these privacy settings, learn about this technology, learn about it, this technology, and then you are empowered to make a good decision. That system to me is absolutely impractical. Even if it worked, it would be absurdly costly, as a number of scholars have demonstrated, and it doesn't work in my belief, based on behavior research. So that's not to me a solution. The much more difficult question is then what is the, 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 the right solution? That's where I edge then into a little bit the normative angle where I, I essentially, I, I have started feeling, which is paradoxical, really. Or perhaps not, perhaps it is the, the trajectory of research, which I was mentioning, started right here, right? and led me for 20 years to study economics of privacy. I started realizing more and more, perhaps why um, privacy is, uh, privacy invasions are associated with uh, creepiness because they are examples of those things that somehow our minds, perhaps for evolutionary reasons, perceive as potentially dangerous, even though we are not able to precisely quantify why. So perhaps in the sense of creep that we feel when we are violating our privacy is this ability of the brain to say, although I cannot really pinpoint that I'm going to lose $2 from this, I feel that this is risky. And perhaps this in turn lead to, and that's perhaps also the point of my NBR piece, that there is wisdom in tackling privacy as a fundamental human right. And that we economists who have been focusing so much on the trade-offs and that's useful, we should never forget that privacy is more than what is quantifiable about it. Because one solution would be in that surplus argument to get the surplus back to consumers directly, right? To insert, to insert consumers in there as beneficiaries of the monetary surplus. I mean, I have my huge skepticism. Yeah, the data that. dividends, right. Yeah, that to me is the data ownership argument. Which right. I personally disagree with, but that's just another super interesting angle, right? The data dividends and the data markets, they could help in some ways, they could be pretty, pretty not, not necessarily great in other ways, it, it, precisely because they, they, they could, what is one concern? That they could reinforce this idea that everything about privacy can be quantified, right? That we can precisely determine the trade off, the cost and the benefits of privacy. And this may sound odd, said by an economist. But no, we cannot quantify everything. And by the way, I'm not the only economist who says this. I, I really stand on the shoulders of giants because the debate I'm discussing, which some of you have seen for read from the NDRPs, started in the 1980s. Posner, Eric Posner, presented privacy essentially through economic lessons and trade-offs. And Jack Hirschleifer saying, wait a second, privacy is about autonomy in society. And he was a great economist. And uh, he, he said that when we look at privacy purely through economic lessons, we risk uh, focusing on this little peninsula and forgetting that there is a continent around it. Take one last question for Paul. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Thank this you. is great. 
Um, recently, I got a targeted advertisement for what is a blanket, which is very large and round, and it looks exactly like a giant tortilla. <laughs> and, and so I, I thought, that's great. Now I can know what it's like to be taco filling. <laughs> but I'd like to point out that before I saw that advertisement, I didn't know that there was this potential value that could be added to my life, which is, I think, very different than the Benadryl example that you had, because once I need an antihistamine, I generally know that I need an antihistamine. Um, so I guess the question is whether this is another aspect, or I would guess a portion of consumer welfare that perhaps is not being measured. And, and isn't this actually where we would expect maybe the majority, if, if there was, if there was benefit to be gained for consumers? Because in the narrow example of looking for an antihistamine, I, I would suggest that search costs are already very small today. This is not really very much savings to do that. Type into Google pretty much as I think your algorithm has done. Um, but, but in the case of product discovery, and, and in particular, maybe if we imagine a long tail of products that could generate value for consumers, um, is there some way to, to measure that? Or is, and is that part of the normal sort of economic search theories? So, great point, great question. And yes, it is absolutely part of uh, economic search theory. Economists and marketing um, scholars have distinguished between this informational value advertising versus the persuasive value advertising, right? So some ads could actually be very beneficial to, uh, to consumers because they, they, they increase their information about what products are uh, around. And some ads don't have uh, anything uh, other than uh, some emotional connection with the product. Uh, and they are persuasive in uh, uh, leading a consumer to buy a product. Now, so I don't think that this meets the informational value of targeted ads at all. It does happen. What, what we were surprised was that in our own results, going back to the to, to these relevance uh, uh, subjective metrics uh, that I reported, what I was surprised was to, to discover, what we were surprised was to discover that in our sample, the, the more relevant ads were actually for things that people had already been searched. So we didn't have anyone uh, reporting, discovering this, uh, the pleasure of potentially being a taco, <laughs> I mean, the tortilla, uh, uh, mat, uh, blanket, uh, uh, thanks to that. <laughs> uh, but this does not mean that uh, th there is no information value in us, not at all. In, in fact, this allows me to end uh, with uh, perhaps a necessary caveat and limitation. The, our studies are run on online samples with, you know, about 500 people in each of these two studies. So we are not able to tease out the, the marginal, but still significant effects that an entity, when doing studies in the order of 1 million transactions, 1 million observations, may be able to tease out. Well, thank you so much. Thank I know you. people have more questions. Maybe you can...